Hello everyone. Welcome to this video on analysis of the syllabus of sociology as an optional in civil services examination, especially conducted by UPSC. And along with that, the discussion or the analysis of the previous trend of questions. Okay. In the very beginning, let me uh, accept this. This video is going to be a little bit lengthy. Why? We are going to cover two quite holistic topics, quite, quite vast topics. Number one, I'm going to discuss, I'm going to analyze the syllabus, the syllabus as it has been given by UPSC. And then I'm going to also understand the trend of questions. Yeah. So these, these two are quite uh, seriously quite vast areas. So obviously this, this uh, particular video cannot be very short cannot be uh, covered uh, with, within a few minutes or so. It is going to be lengthy. Okay. Now, let's start with the first point first, that is the analysis of the syllabus. See, in the beginning only, let me tell you, UPSC may have given us the syllabus break, broken up into papers, right? Paper one and paper two. But if I talk about sociology as a subject, is the subject broken into two papers? No, it is not. Right? So this breaking apart the two papers, that is paper one and paper two, this is something artificially done by UPSC. Right? So when we'll study, we'll start studying the uh, syllabus, when we'll start analyzing the syllabus, we'll realize that number of topics which have been broken, which have been divided and uh, separated, dissected into two papers, paper one and paper two, it's better to club them back and study them together. And then again, there comes the aspect uh, of the organic uh, linking of the syllabus because of which we need to uh, approach one topic after the other topic. So that, that linkage should also be understood properly. That's exactly what we are going to do right now. Now, if I start with the first point, People ordinarily think that uh, let's start with uh, paper one, and uh, that's that's a general trend as well, and that's a right trend as well, right? Uh, if you ask me personally, I always prefer to start with uh, the the first topics of paper one. Why? The very first topic of paper one. What is that topic? Sociology, the discipline, right? The first point mentioned in sociology, the discipline is uh, rise of modernity in Europe and emergence of sociology. Okay. But is that the first topic from where we should start? No. The honest answer is no. See, if, you, if you're trying to understand things properly, if you want to organically uh, grow in the subject, then anyone should start with the understanding of society first. That, is, that, that means the definition of society, what we mean by society. Then the person should also go to understand what is sociology. What is the subject sociology? Before you talk about the rise of the subject sociology, let's first talk about what is sociology. The very subject I'm out to study, I'm going to study, right? So the first point, though it is not explicitly mentioned in the syllabus of UPSC. Yes, there are a number of things which are not explicitly mentioned in the syllabus of UPSC. I'm not going to deny that, right? This is where actually a trained person in the field of sociology uh, his or her uh, caliber becomes visible, right? Number of topics, they have been unnecessarily split apart in the syllabus. There are a number of topics which are implicit. So be careful, right? You need to understand the syllabus properly. You need to understand the structuring of the syllabus properly. Then it's preferable to approach the subject, whichever subject it might be. So here, since we are uh, talking about sociology, let's go ahead that way only, fine? Now, as I said, that the first thing you should do, you should try to understand what is society, try to define society, right? After defining society, then go to define what is sociology. Only when you know what sociology is, then it, it becomes uh, the, the second priority to understand how this particular subject came up, right? So here now comes the, the point that has been mentioned in the syllabus explicitly, that is, rise of modernity in Europe and emergence of sociology. Okay, so far so clear. Now, immediately after understanding, after understanding what sociology is, after understanding how sociology came into being, we need to understand the nature of the subject, right? What is the subject? What is, what is it doing? Uh, what are the scopes of the subject? 
exactly that's what is given there scope of the subject sociology right let me break the discussion on the scope of the subject sociology see as we understand society is the subject matter of sociology in sociology we study the modern society and the postmodern society right that's a predominant subject subject matter yes i do admit we also look at the historic uh, societies we look at the pre-modern societies as well for comparative analysis to understand from where we started how the journey happened and where we are standing how we came to this particular location or how we came to this particular position right so to understand that we do look at the pre-modern societies as well but the pre-modern societies are not the primary subject matter of sociology right the primary subject matter of sociology is the modern society and the postmodern society fine but even the modern and the postmodern societies they are quite vast how to study them how to start looking at them that's exactly what is discussed in the scope of the subject sociology right the scope of the subject sociology practically opens up the doors to look into to peep into the society that okay th th these are the windows using these windows look into the society that's how we should be looking into the society but it is in this backdrop also comes the point of comparison of sociology with other social sciences right ordinarily we we uh, in india we get confused between the uh, subjects of uh, arts humanities social sciences we think they all are the same no they are not the same right so here comes the discussion that sociology is a typical subject of social science what are the other subjects of social science and how are they different from one another especially how is sociology different from those particular subjects in in its scope in its methodology in its approach right in its point of view that's what we try to understand that's what we try to study there similarly when sociology was coming up as a new subject right uh, this is around 1890s uh, 1900 early 19, 1900s there was a strong debate going on <clears throat> sorry that why do we need a separate subject like sociology okay because the other social sciences or especially common sense common sense ideas they can help us very easily understand so many nuances of the society so this debate was going on that do we actually need a separate subject like sociology this debate was going on now naturally comes the point that we should compare sociology with common sense here right so these are the things which are given there in the uh, chapter one of paper one and uh, if you ask me i would always suggest ki, yes start from here only yes i i added two particular points even before the chapter one started i added the point of uh, defining society or understanding society and at the same point of time i uh, uh, also added the point of defining sociology right so these two things i i did and then i said ki, okay and accordingly you go ahead with the chapter one of paper one that should take place then comes the chapter two of paper two chapter two of paper one sorry chapter two of paper one what is that sociology as science now i'm further getting in depth into understanding the exact nature of sociology right i call sociology social science right not just me we we uh, we do admit we do accept that sociology is a subject of social science so as a subject of social science how is its nature what are the nuances right we need to understand that in depth clear now in any subject of science the uh, objectivity the matter of objectivity becomes very significant right if you're not objective enough you would never be able to look into the reality the real picture properly so objectivity objectivity becomes very significant to achieve objectivity it, it's easier said than done but uh, achieving objectivity is very difficult even the great scholars they they, they also not they, they were not always objective enough so how to achieve objectivity right the best possible way we talk about is through value neutrality that if you be value neutral through value neutrality you can achieve objectivity so now comes the point that what is value if i have to be value neutral what is value right and then obviously any subject of science whether the social sciences whether the natural sciences they need to base base themselves base their discussions on facts hardcore facts right 
So comes the point of fact, value, and objectivity. If you realize what I'm doing, I am not exactly following the in internal dynamics of chapter two. Chapter two starts with science, scientific method, and its critic. Then it talks about major theoretical strands of research methodology. Then it talks about positivism and its critic. Then it talks about fact, value, and objectivity. Fact, value, and objectivity is the fourth internal point of chapter two. But what I'm suggesting you, that no. Start from fact, value, and objectivity. Start from that fourth point first. Right? If you want to carry on organically, if you want to understand things properly, right? we need to tweak the syllabus a little bit. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm doing here. Clear? So I would always suggest we go for fact, value, and objectivity in the beginning of chapter two. Right? After you studied the fact, value, and objectivity, now go for the major theoretical strands. Right? What do we mean by theoretical strands? Nothing but the theoretical approaches. Strand, right? Strand or strain is like a fiber. Okay? Strand of a fiber, strand of a jute or something like that. That's what we say. That's how we, we say. It, right? So here, what we are looking at, the understanding is that sociology is, a, is one subject. But to study... Within sociology, number of methods are applied, right? What are the major methodologies? Those methodologies are being called as the theoretical strand, the fibers of the theory of the subject sociology. That's why this term has been used, theoretical strand. Okay. So what are the major theoretical strands here? Ordinarily, we talk about the five major theoretical strands, starting with positivism, then functionalism, then conflict methodology or conflict theory or radical approach. People also call that Marxist approach. Then uh, uh, in interactionist perspective or interpretive sociology, that's uh, the fourth method. And lastly, the symbolic interactionism. These are the five major theoretical approaches or theoretical strands or methodologies in sociology. But if you ask me, I'll say don't stop here. There are some minor theoretical strands as well. Include them as well here in the discussion. Right? Though they are not specifically mentioned. Doesn't matter. Because the subsequent discussion, if you have to understand the subsequent discussion properly, also include the minor theoretical strands here itself. Minor theoretical strands like, say, ethnomethodology, ethnography, hermeneutics, phenomenology, epistemology, dramaturgical perspective. Mostly these, these, these six, actually, right? Again, I'm repeating myself. Ethnomethodology, ethnography, phenomenology, hermeneutics, epistemology, dramaturgical perspective. Okay? In fact, uh, in 2023, they have asked a question on dramaturgical perspective. One French scholar called Le Bon, he, he gave the idea of dramaturgical perspective. Let's not uh, delve in, in, into the syllabus right now. Let's not start studying the topics. Just look at the syllabus. Just analyze the syllabus. From, from the top, right? So I'm not getting into the perspective of dramaturgical uh, understandings right now. But these minor theoretical strands are also there, right? So what I'm suggesting is whenever you're studying something, study it properly, study it holistically, so that ultimately your effort gets streamlined. This is very significant. This is very important to get your efforts streamlined. That matters, okay? So <clears throat> first I said, okay, go for the major theoretical strands. After the major theoretical strands, then go for the minor theoretical strands as well simultaneously. Now, among these theoretical strands or among these methodologies, the first methodology that was brought into sociology from philosophy was positivism, right? Uh, the founding father of sociology, August Comte, he only would bring this into sociology. In fact, all the three first three scholars in sociology, August Comte, Herbert Spencer, uh, Emile Durkheim, right? My pronunciation may vary because uh, I have heard people uh, trying to use the uh, exact French pronunciation calling August Comte instead of Comte. Uh, some call him Emile Durkheim. Uh, I'm using the general English pronunciation. So to me, he is August Comte. Uh, that's what I'm pronouncing. And uh, Emile Durkheim, that's how I'm pronouncing. Okay. 
Herbert Spencer too is a British name. Uh, he was a British. He was an uh, Englishman. So the name we 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 can pronounce it properly. But the French names obviously at times they do have uh, issues. The French words as well with respect to the pronunciation they do have issues. Uh, anyway, let's come back. So when I'm looking at these three uh, early scholars, they all were positivistic. They all were positivists. So this was the first major uh, methodology or first major theoretical approach that was introduced in sociology. So obviously, there is a lot of uh, emotional issue, sentimentality uh, attached with positivism. But uh, if you ask me in present perspectives, positivism, the classical form of positivism is losing its sheen. Right. So there is uh, quite a bit of criticism of positivism as well. The way positivism approached sociology, the study of sociology and all that thing. Uh, we don't find that uh, really uh, something something uh, doable. Right. So from that point of view, this criticism part also becomes significant. Fine. So naturally, obviously, when, when you're studying the major theoretical strands, along with the major theoretical strands, along with studying positivism, also study the criticism part of positivism. Then comes the uh, understanding that ultimately is sociology a subject of science? Because positivism essentially tried to establish sociology as a subject of science, positivistic methodology, right? Uh, I was talking about August Comte, Herbert Spencer, Emile Durkheim. They essentially tried to establish sociology as a subject of science. Now, is it actually a subject of science? And if we call it a subject of science, what kind of subject of science is it? Is it uh, at par with the natural sciences like physics, biology, or chemistry? Or is has it its own way of approach? What is it, right? That discussion comes then, right? So see what happened here in this one chapter only, what I did, the way I completely changed the um, internal dynamics of the chapter. I started with the fourth point first. I went for fact, value, and objectivity first. Then I suggested you to go for the major theoretical strands, right? The, the major theoretical approaches in sociology that we do. And while doing that, I said, hey, study it holistically, not only the major theoretical approaches, also the minor theoretical approaches. Now, when you're doing that, right, while doing that only, uh, while studying positivism only, the criticism part of positivism will also come. But UPSC has separately mentioned positivism and its critic. There's no point. This is unnecessarily separating a topic and mentioning it explicitly. But this topic anyway is an integral part of another, another point mentioned here. So if you have to study major theoretical strands, by default, you'll be studying positivism and its criticism. Okay. Similarly, the anti-positivistic methodologies, right? What are the anti-positivistic methodologies? Predominantly, I'll be talking about uh, interactions perspective or interpretive sociology. Then uh, symbolic interactionism is also anti-positivistic in nature. Uh, Ethnomethodology is also anti-positivistic in nature. nature. Um, phenomenology is also anti-positivistic in nature. So when I'm looking at uh, these particular methodologies, when I'm studying these particular theoretical approaches, in any way I'm studying the anti-positivistic methodologies. So why to mention this separately? Right. So do you realize what's happening? What what is being done here in the syllabus? That some of the points they are being unnecessarily separated, unnecessarily being mentioned separately, while they are in any way we we have to do them as part of the previous points mentioned. Right. Now, once you go forward with this, then organically comes the first point that has been mentioned in chapter two, that is science, scientific method and critic. That at the end, let's let's finally come to the point that can we call sociology a subject of science? Right. Can we use the scientific methods in the study of sociology? Right. I told you, I gave you a little bit of idea that the people who are positivists, they they tried to establish sociology as a subject of science. Now, the methodologies of science, are they actually applicable? So there are people, I said, ki, there are methodologies, I said, which are anti-positivistic, which go against this idea. Now, do they think that a sociology is not a subject of science? Or do they think that the scientific methods are ultimately not ac acceptable or applicable in sociology? Right? That discussion comes here. Science, scientific method, and its critic. Clear? So that's how the chapter two is.
So if you've understood what I did, I practically squeezed the chapter two into, uh, into anything. And then I, I completely rearranged it, right? So this is exactly what, what's going to happen with the, with the whole syllabus. Chapter two was just a trailer, if I may say. Okay, chapter two of paper one was just a trailer in that sense. Next, uh, in the uh, syllabus, it is mentioned uh, research methodologies. Now, personally, I take up research methodology at the end. Why I take up research methodology at, at the end? Because it's quite dry, right? But it's also suggestible if someone wants, you can pick up research methodology here. After studying chapter two, after studying the uh, concept of sociology as a science, right? Then yes, you can pick up a uh, research methodology here. You can try to understand because you've already understood the theoretical uh, approaches, right? You've already understood uh, the major theoretical approaches and the minor theoretical approaches. N while understanding those, you, you will be exposed to the idea of qualitative and quantitative data, qualitative research and qu quantitative research, right? There are a number of aspects. Say, if I talk about satisfaction, if I talk about happiness, right, individual happiness within society, can you quantify that? It's very difficult. It's qualitative. It's completely subjective to an individual. If I say uh, a person is doing something, just try to understand the rational or the logic behind that action, right? It's completely subjective to that person, right? These are qualitative data, qualitative uh, approaches. So, uh, as a result, you can understand that the difference between qualitative and quantitative approaches, methods, that is. Similarly, uh, the way we collect data, data for our analysis. See, quantitative data, they have their own way of, uh, of collection. It can be in the questionnaire format and so many other formats. Qualitative data, on the other hand, they need uh, different approaches, interview, which can be structured interview, semi-structured interview, or completely unstructured interview. Even uh, the structured interviews are not always very effective in collecting qualitative data. Yeah. So uh, again, again, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm getting uh, in depth into the topics. I'm starting to discuss the topics. Uh, I'm starting to actually uh, analyze. This is the uh, video for analysis of syllabus. And at times I'm getting in depth into the topics. Let's not do that. So let's keep it uh, on, on the surface area only. So yes, uh, naturally you can understand that uh, for the sake of uh, qualitative data, we need a separate kind of approaches. For quantitative data, we need separate kind of approaches. And while collecting this data, you'll be coming across a huge amount of variability factors. Then uh, if someone is trying to develop a hypothesis, uh, there would be sampling, right? So, and there would be the issue of uh, reliability and validity of the data as well. So all these things you have to deal with. And these things are mentioned there in the syllabus in research methodology. So if you want, you can take those things up here. But what I feel, if someone is taking up research methodology here, right, unnecessarily they're dealing with too much of theories without understanding their practical application. So personally, what I do, I take up the research methodology at the end. Before that, I uh, I try to expose people to the to the idea of of uh, what's going on on the ground, right? I uh, I better study the the other parts, and then finally I go for these theoretical dimensions. In that way, what happens? The subject becomes a little bit more interesting. That can be done, and that's why I do it. But if someone wants, they can uh, they can start with the uh, research methodology here as well. It is dry, but you can do it because you have already got the foundation of this discussion in chapter two, in the discussion of chapter two. Okay, now comes the thinkers. Yes, I would always suggest that after chapter one and chapter two, one should always go for the thinkers. The thinkers should be the third chapter as such. But again, I'm saying if someone wants to take up a research methodology as a third chapter, well and good, can do that. So then the thinkers will become uh, the fourth chapter. While going for the thinkers, first try and understand why these thinkers are significant. I talked about the theoretical strands, especially the major theoretical strands, right? I talked about positivism, functionalism, uh, conflict theory or conflict approach, radical approach. I talked about interactionist perspective or interpretive methodology. Both the terms are used. I talked about the uh, also uh, interactionist uh, perspective or interpretive sociology is also called the neo-idealism. 
right? That's also a term which is used. Uh, don't get confused because UPSC uses these different terms while asking questions. That's why I'm intentionally exposing these terms in front of you, or I'm exposing you to these terms. Okay. So uh, now comes the uh, interactionist or interpretive sociology or neo idealism. Then after that, the fifth major theoretical strand that is symbolic interactionism. Clear? So these are the five theoretical strands that we are looking at. <clears throat> the six scholars whom we are looking at in paper one, they're actually pioneers in these particular five methodologies. Say, for example, if I talk about Emile Durkheim, Emile Durkheim, he followed August Comte and Herbert Spencer, and he also confirmed to positivism. But he also introduced functionalism from social anthropology to sociology. So while positivism came from philosophy to sociology, functionalism came from social anthropology to sociology. And who is introducing it? Durkheim is introducing it. The next scholar I'm looking at is Karl Marx. In the syllabus, Karl Marx is mentioned first. Uh, the syllabus is following chronological approach. I would say no, follow the approach, organic approach of, you, of, of sociology. Okay. So there, obviously, uh, Emile Durkheim should be start, studied first because he is the one who, for the first time, started talking about sociology as a subject. Okay. Tried to establish sociology properly. Um, August Comte may, had a, may have had introduced the subject, but he was not, uh, he, he failed in establishing the subject. Right. That was done by Emile Durkheim. Again, uh, while studying these, these scholars, you'll understand that. Not right now. So next comes uh, Karl Marx, who's talking about the conflict perspective or uh, the conflict dynamics. Then comes uh, Max Weber. Max Weber is a person who introduced interactionist perspective or interpretive sociology or new idealism, whatever term you may use. It's given by Max Weber. He is the pioneer there. Uh, Karl Marx is a pioneer of conflict scholars, conflict school. Uh, after Max Weber, next comes Talcott Parsons. Talcott Parsons would be a structural functionalist, a part of a functionalism only, classical functionalism only, but a different branch of functionalism, structural functionalism. So he's also doing something unique. That's why we are taking him as a pioneering scholar. Then comes Robert King Martin. He again is giving a new dimension to functionalism called a neo functionalism. He's completely rejecting the old school. Uh, Emile Durkheim, Dr. Parsons is rejecting them. And he's giving his new, new brand of functionalism called a neo functionalism. That's why he's also being called as neo functionalist or a pioneering scholar. And then comes George Herbert Mead, the symbolic interactionist perspective. Okay, so that's why these six thinkers, they are mentioned there. I would suggest, along with these six thinkers, also study the thinkers of paper two. In paper two as well, in section A, three thinkers have been mentioned specifically. Who are they? I'm looking at G.S. Ghure, right? Indology by G.S. Ghure, Structural Functionalism by Emen Srinivas, and Marxist Perspective by A.R. Desai. See, the difference between the thinkers of paper one and the thinkers of paper two, with respect to the thinkers of paper one, their works are mentioned, right? What kind of works they did, those works are also being studied. In case of the thinkers of paper two, only their method, the methodology is being mentioned. Indology, structural functionalism, Marxist perspective. If you're following the syllabus along with me, you'll find these things, right? So there is a difference in the approach of the two sets of thinkers. But I would suggest you study all the nine thinkers together. So the six thinkers of paper one and the three thinkers of paper two. Here, let me, uh, let me delve a little bit. I'm taking, uh, just excuse me a little bit. See, if I look at sociology holistically, the subject holistically, not just this, these nine thinkers, uh, there are a few more thinkers whom we would be studying, say, F.G. Bailey. Kingsley Davis, Kings, Davis and, uh, Kingsley Davis and Wilbert e. Moore together, Melvin M. Tumin, Ralph Darendorf, uh, Kame Kapadia, um, Milton Singer, Pauline Golenda, Iravati Karave, Kathleen Goff. You're getting scared, right? Don't be. Max to max 20 to 25 people whose work you need to know somewhat. 
Andre Bete, Louis Dumo, I forgot these names. They should also be mentioned here. So max to max 20 to 25 people, not more than that. Don't unnecessarily burden yourself. Right? And then let me tell you, yes, there is a myth about this. People say in sociology, you have to study so many people, so many thinkers, and you have to remember so many things. No. You understand them, and they all have their utility. And it is not unique about sociology. Any subject, for that matter. Say, if I talk about geography, right? The person who's doing master's in geography or the person who's, who's uh, carrying forward with geography as an optional, they have to study about uh, Mackinder, uh, right? They have to stock, uh, study about, uh, say, Harry Hayes, Alfred Wegener. In every subject, they have 20, 25 scholars who, who have made tremendous contribution. So whenever we, we study anything, we have to take their names. Say, can anyone study with uh, physics without naming uh, Isaac Newton? The three laws of motion of Isaac Newton. It becomes normal. It becomes organic. The same thing happens with sociology as well. Don't get scared here. Right? While studying things, they, these people will also come organically. Right? And don't try to mug them. Nah. Understand them. Understand what they are talking about. It's very simple. Clear? So this myth, uh, we should always be dealing with this myth again and again. No, soci sociology is not a bombarding you with the names of thinkers, suggesting you to mug a lot and all that. No, it's not happening like that. Clear? But here, no, we need to study practically some uh, nine, ten people, I would say. Ten people. Why ten people? I've talked about nine people. Right? No, in paper two, section A, two more points are mentioned. Social background of Indian nationalism, right? That is a work of A.R. Desai. So when you're looking at that point, for the first time, I'm looking at the work of one of the Indian thinkers, social background of Indian nationalism by A.R. Desai. Then another point is mentioned there. Sorry. That is modernization of Indian traditions in section A only by Yogendra Singh. So practically, I'm looking at how many thinkers now? Six pioneering thinkers in paper one. That is Emile Durkheim, Karl Marx, Max Weber, Talcott Parsons, Robert King Merton, G.H. Uh, Mead. And then I'm looking at G.S. Ghure, Emin Srinivas, A.R. Desai, and Yogendra Singh. That's it. These 10 thinkers at a stretch one should study. I was talking about the difference between the thinkers of paper one and paper two. I told you that in uh, with respect to the thinkers of paper one, we study their works holistically, not in the in case of the thinkers of paper two. For the for the thinkers of paper two, we only study their methodology. So when we are studying the works of the thinkers of paper one, don't you think they, these works should be compared with each other, especially if there are similarities? So that comparative analysis should also come after this, and you'll find these things in the questions as well. Right, UPSC would again and again compare one work of uh, Emile Durkheim with another work of Karl Marx or with another work of uh, Max Weber. Like this, this compar comparison between the works of these people would also happen. So we need to study the uh, 10 thinkers here and we need to study the comparison between the six, especially the five, first five I mentioned, that is Emile Durkheim, Karl Marx, Max Weber, Talcott Parsons, Robert King Martin. Their works should be compared thoroughly. Right, those those works which are having something similar with each other. Right. Next comes, uh, say for example, I would uh, like to repeat this. I would like to give you an example. Both, actually, all the three that is uh, Emile Durkheim, Karl Marx, and Max Weber, they all are talking about religion. Religion. Okay. So obviously, while studying uh, these three thinkers, we need to understand what they are talking about religion, how they are looking at religion. Clear? So this kind of comparison can be done. Fine. Now, after that, next comes stratification. Right? After, after you're done with these uh, thinkers, next comes stratification. See, I have mentioned about the scope of the subject sociology already. Right? And I told you that the scope of the subject sociology, it, they are actually windows, windows to study the society. There are actually five uh, such uh, windows which we look at. Five windows through which we can look into sociology. 
One is social action, the action done by you and me, right? Uh, ordinarily, when we are in the society, say you meet a new person, you greet the person, right? Whether you shake hand with the person or you say hello to the person, or if the person is elderly in our culture, what we do, we touch the feet or we say namaste to the person, right? Th these are greetings. Why do you do it, right? The society is teaching us to do that. So all these actions that we do, if we study those actions through that as well, we can understand the internal dynamics of the society, right? Simultaneously, uh, I'm also looking at uh, institutions, the various social institutions, say education, say judiciary, political system, right? Uh, really religious system, family. These are, these are what? These are institutions of the society. Why they call the institution, we'll study when, when we study them, not here. But these are the institutions in the society. So when, uh, whenever uh, possible, if we, if we look at these things, through studying these institutions as well, we can understand the nature of the society. Next comes structure. Structure of the society, how the society is structured, how the society, uh, people in the society, they are divided into various groups, how these groups are hierarchically uh, structured above one another right uh then how how they interact with each other right the first part is a uh, discussion of social structure the second part the interaction between these groups how people they behave uh the, the behavior how it is guided by the interactions between the groups say if i talk about the brahmins and the shudras right we have heard these these terms in india we know about caste system the varnashrama chatur varnashrama we all know about that how does the Brahmins and the Shudras, they behave with each other? What kind of behavioral pattern happens? That's a discussion of organization, right? So the first part, how the society is given to groups and how the groups are structured, oh, that's the discussion of social structure. That's the third window, social structure. The fourth window is social organization. The behavior or the interaction between the groups, that's social organization. And the last one is culture. The fifth window is culture. These are the five scopes of the subject sociology as we understand the five windows through which we can study the society okay now naturally uh, when we go to study social stratification is a typical topic of social structure and social organization that's what we study from here right but this top chapter number five mentioned in paper one don't think it is a unique or one particular chapter here. Club certain topics from paper two, right? At times you're looking at something from, from the right-hand side corner. This is nothing but the uh, syllabus that I have in my hand, right? I would be referring to the syllabus. So when I'm talking about stratification and mobility in paper one, always club this with section two of paper two. What is section two? I'm looking at rural and agrarian social structure. I'm looking at caste system, tribal communities, social classes in India right especially the moment you're studying stratification and mobility in paper one immediately along with that the first thing that should come is caste system caste system of paper two club it but don't stop there right so when i talk about uh, stratification and mobility right of paper one it has to be clubbed with caste system in paper two similarly Rural and agrarian social structure should also come. I told you, stratification is a study of what? Social structure. And see, that term is used here. Rural and agrarian social structure. Right? The structure, how the society, how the rural society in India was structured. A study of that. Clear? Then also I'm looking at the classes which emerged in India, especially post-independent India. The agrarian class structure, the middle class, the industrial class. Right? How, how these classes, they are structured, that discussion comes here. And then the tribals, they are also part of the Indian social structure. We cannot leave them as well. So whenever we are studying, we are going to study stratification and mobility in paper one, we should not be taking them up separately, individually, because stratification and mobility is nothing but part of the study of social structure and social organization. So if we have to study social structure and social organization properly, right, we need to take these topics from paper two and club them with that topic of stratification mobility of paper one. That's what I was saying in the beginning, that yes, UPSC has given us the subject, 
if UPS has divided the subject into two papers, but that division is artificial, don't approach that way. Club them back. Clear? After strategization and mobility, next topic I would suggest should be work and economic life. Why? While studying stratification and mobility, especially while studying caste system in India, we will understand how caste, the ancient caste system, also gave rise to class. Caste is a socio-religious concept. Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, when we are talking about them, right? Uh, I'm obviously looking at shloka number 13 of Purusha Suktam of 10th Mandala, 10th chapter of Rig Veda, which says Brahmano Sumkhumasit, Bahu Rajan Nikrita, Urutara Sayyad Vaishya, Padbhyagum Shudra Ajayata. Right. So here I'm looking at the four Varnas, but no, there are actually five Varnas. We'll study that while studying the uh, caste system. But this socio religious concept gradually would also lead, lead to the rise of economic disparity and will convert into class. We call this the caste class continuum in India. With the advent of the British, we would look at this caste class continuum, how the caste would convert into class as well. Clear? So I'm already looking at rise of the economic aspect within the society. Clear? So now, once we have started discussion about the economic dimensions within society, we should talk about how work as an economic aspect is being structured by the society. Even caste is what? Right? People say that caste, uh, there, there are scholars who say that caste is nothing but social organization of work. If that be the case, okay, this particular type of job is, being, is to be done by this particular group, that particular job is to be done by that particular group. Right. So here, essentially, I'm looking at the work and economic dimensions of the society. So that should be taken up immediately after the study of stratification and mobility. Clear? Then we should take up the concept of family. Right. Family, marriage, kinship in paper one. You'll also find a corresponding topic of uh, systems of kinship in India in paper two, in section B only. Right. Immediately after uh, social uh, uh, social classes in India, the system of kinship in India is mentioned. So take up that immediately, along with family marriage kinship in paper one. Then after that, one should go for politics and society, right? That should come then. Similarly, I have a topic of politics and society in paper two as well. In this, uh, that's mentioned actually. In section C, in section C, you will find politics and society, right? Actually, two topics, two, two chapters from paper two should be taken up straightforward. Politics and society from paper one, which is the chapter number seven of paper one, along with chapter number four of section C of paper two, that is politics and society in India, and chapter number five of section C of paper two, that is social movements in India. These three should be clubbed together. First, politics and society in paper one, then politics and society in paper two, then social movements in India. Clear? These three now create the organic structure here. Why? While studying politics and society only, you would be studying about the protest, agitation, social movements, revolutions, collective action, all these things. Right? Elaboration of that is there in social movements in India. What kind of movements happened in India? So in paper one, we are discussing the theories. In paper two, we are having the examples. Clear? So what we should do while writing answers, even in paper one, use these examples. Use these examples from paper two. There's nothing wrong. Please don't think that paper one is separate, paper two is separate. No. While writing answers of paper one, you can use the examples from paper two. Similarly, while writing the answers of paper two, you can use the theories from paper one very easily. It's absolutely all right. Sociology is one subject. Don't, don't try to distinguish them. Clear? No. After politics and society, next should be religion and society. Okay? So, comes religion and society in paper one and religion and society in paper two as well. In paper two, section B, immediately after system of kinship in India, the sixth, top, sixth chapter that's mentioned in section B is religion and society in India. Club these two again. Religion society in paper one and religion society in paper two. Club them together. Clear? 
are doing the same thing as I am saying. Okay. Next, after this, go for social change. Okay. Social change, why it should be taken up at the end, at the, at the uh, end of this discussion. The reason is in all these discussions, we have looked at different forms of changes that happened. I told you in the beginning only that in sociology, ordinarily we look at the modern and the postmodern society. But we also do look into the pre-modern societies and we understand from where we started our journey, how the changes happened and how, where we are standing right now, how we came to this particular position. This journey, journey of change, if you have to study that, you have to study that holistically from every possible dimension. That's why first study stratification, look at the changes that happened, right? I talked about caste class continuum, how caste gave rise to class in India, right? Similarly, uh, family, how the family structure used to be, say, joint family, from joint family to rise of nuclear family, these, ch these changes. Similarly, religion and its uh, dimensions, the changes that we are looking at. Uh, politics, the way we are looking at changes in politics in India, or uh, overall the changes in political structure that we are looking at, power dynamics that we are looking at. Now comes your understanding, your study of change. Right now, orga organically should come your study of change. Okay, when we start studying change, change is the perhaps the biggest topic in the whole syllabus. Maybe in paper one, it's only chapter 10, which is talking about social change, right? The whole of paper two is practically the study of social change. It starts with visions of social change in India, then rural and agrarian transformation, the changes that happen in the rural and agrarian structure. Industrialization and urbanization in India, that's also a form of change, how the changes in, in terms of industrialization and urbanization that happened. Then comes the pop, uh, challenges of social transformation, right? So all these changes that I'm looking at, they all should be clubbed together and studied together. And believe me, this is also the area which is the most dynamic part of paper two, right? So yes, we need to keep an eye, anyone, any aspirant who's studying it properly should keep an eye on uh, the, the, the recently happening events on the newspapers. Clear, this is the most dynamic area of sociology. Clear. So that's how the syllabus should be structured. Once this is done, now go for population dynamics, right? And if you ask me, ordinarily what I suggest, okay, now it's better to take up research methodology, right? That's what I do. So this is how the syllabus should be structured and the syllabus should be approached. Now, in this backdrop, let's also talk about the trend of the questions that we look at, the way UPSC asks questions. See, what we are going to do, we are going to first understand the structure of the papers, whether paper one and paper two. Uh, how many segments they're divided, how many questions are given by UPSC, and how many questions you're supposed to write. And then we'll go for from which particular sections, how many questions are found. Okay. That is going to be the last point uh, from which, which particular sections we should be focusing upon and that discussion. First, whether it's paper one or paper two, they both are divided into section A and section B. Right? There will be four questions in section A, four questions in section B, both the papers, paper one and paper two, same structure. Among the four questions of section A, question number one, that will be mandatory, right? In both the papers, paper one and paper two, question number one is mandatory. Similarly, in section B, both the papers, question number five would be mandatory. So in section A, how many questions are there? Four questions, one, two, three, and four. Paper one, paper two, both. Similarly. In paper one and paper two, both in section B, I'm finding five, six, seven, and eight. Question number one and question number five, they, uh, they, they are made up of short notes only. Five, five short notes, all compulsory. There is no choice. You have to answer all the five short notes. Okay. So uh, this way, uh, in uh, paper one, there would be 18 short notes, five in uh, question number one in section A, five in question number five in section B. Then comes the six other questions, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, right? Two, three, four, and six, seven, eight, they would be consisting of three questions each. Two long questions of 20 marks, one short notes of 10 marks, each question. 
So tell me how many questions then are there in paper one or paper two? In paper one, you're getting 28 questions. Similarly, in paper two as well, you're getting 28 questions. How? There would be 10 short notes I talked about, question number one and five. Five short notes in question number one, five short notes in question number five. Similarly, there would be six short notes in each of two, three, four, six, seven, eight. All the questions would be having one short notes each. One ten marker, C. Right? Question number C, 2C. 3C, 4C, 6C, 7C, 8C, there would be short notes only, right? So total, how many short notes are there in the paper? 16 short notes, okay? And how many long questions are there in the paper? 2A, 2B, similarly 3A, 3B, 4A, 4B, 6A, 6B, 7A, 7B, 8A, 8B. This way, there would be 12 long questions. So 12 long questions, 16 short notes, 28 questions, right? And just tell me how many chapters are there in paper one? 10 chapters, 10 chapters, 28 questions, 10 chapters, 12 long questions, 16 short notes. Do you realize that every year, at least one question we find from every section? at least one question. So don't think that I'm going to leave this particular chapter this year or I'm going to leave that particular chapter that year. No, you cannot. You should not, right? Maybe repetition of question does not happen. Not does not happen that easily, that often. Yes, repetition of question happens. Every year in the question paper, you will find three to four questions which are repetitions from last five years, right? Every year this will be there. But Three to four questions, clear? Now, three to four questions out of 28, right? And then I'm looking at this combination of short notes and long questions. As a result, say uh, you decide you're going to write question number two. There is high probability that one question in question number two would be from say uh, chapter number one or two. One, one long question would be from the thinkers. One short notes would be there from maybe say stratification. This can be. So don't think that you, you can leave any area. That's not something I'll suggest. Not in the present structure. In the present structure, with the with uh, which has started from 2013, with UPSC practically chopping down the question paper, right? Give, giving us more number of questions. Giving us less alternatives, less options. In this condition, Leaving the syllabus, leaving any chapter of the syllabus is out of question. But let's try and understand what kind of questions are asked from which particular area. So if I'm looking at chapter one and chapter two, I'll always say club chapter one and chapter two, treat them as one chapter. You will find at least two short notes and one long question every year. Two short notes, one long question, chapter number one and chapter number two, if you club them together. Similarly, from the thinkers, you can expect at least uh, two long questions and two short notes. From stratification, again, uh, you can expect uh, two long questions and two short notes. Clear? Social change, again, two long questions and two short notes. Clear? This way, if you ask me, I'll say thinkers, stratification, and social change. These three, they have the highest amount of weightage. In all, among all the 10 chapters of paper one, okay? So if you ask me, I'll always suggest ki, please, uh, these three particular chapters give maximum amount of weightage to them, right? But that does not mean that you can, you can excuse a uh, family marriage kinship or politics and society or religion and society. No, you cannot. From there as well, at least two short notes and one long question you can expect. Obviously the things change uh, keeps on changing, they get alternated. Say one year, I may find two short notes and one long question from family. In the next year, I may find two long questions and one short notes from family. So, sorry, this way things may get alternated. In one year, I'm seeing more amount of weightage on politics. On the other year, I'm looking at more amount of weightage on religion. This can happen. But if you think yeah, I'm going to leave this topic, Similarly, work and economic life. Ordinarily, we get short notes from there, right? 
But if you think that I can leave this topic, no. Is there any guarantee that say question number four or question number three won't be having one short nose from uh, work and economic life? Now, can if you don't study work and economic life, you cannot touch that whole question. Do you realize that? And leaving a question is uh, not an option here. Do you know when you leave a question, what you do? If you write, you write something, something uh, in tune with the demand of the question. The examiner will give you something uh, to the tune of uh, three and a half, four, four and a half, right? If you don't write the question, if you don't approach the question, don't write the answer, what, what's happening? You're denying the examiner the possibility of giving you marks. The examiner cannot give you marks. So please never leave a question. That's that's out of, um, that's just strictly no. Never do that. Clear? So what we understood, that every year, there would be 28 questions in paper one and 28 questions in paper two. And the papers will be divided into two sections, section A and section B. And then again, uh, in section A, there would be one compulsory question, that is question number one. Similarly, in section B, there would be one compulsory question, that is question number five. And then out of two, three, four, six, seven, eight, you're, you're supposed to write three questions, right? One from each section. So it can be two and three and seven, or two and four and eight, or it can be two and six and eight, whatever, whatever com combination you feel right you can write it accordingly, right? Whatever, based on your comfortability with the, with the nature of the questions, you can write accordingly. But as we understand, leaving a topic is out of question. You need to study the syllabus holistically. You need to study all the topics of the syllabus holistically. Yeah. So this is what I would suggest. This is what my understanding is about the nature of the syllabus, about the... Uh, how, how the syllabus should be clubbed together, how the syllabus at times should be broken apart, right? And about the trend of the questions. Yeah. I hope you benefit from this discussion, right? If you uh, like this particular video, do subscribe to our channel, right? Thank you. Thank you. That's all.